All right. Hello, everyone. We're going to get started. Um, just um, FYI, this meeting is being recorded. We're going to be talking about how to safely return to the court. Everyone's been so looking forward to the warmer weather and getting moving and, and exercising and playing tennis. And um, we want to make sure that we're really being mindful of the best ways to do that um, safely and, and with wellness and, and the health of maintaining, um, you know, good fitness and, and, um, and everything in mind. So with that said, I want to welcome Dr. Alexis Colvin. Um, Dr. Colvin is a professor of orthopedic surgery and associate dean for alumni affairs at Mount Sinai. She is the chief medical officer for the U.S. Open, the team physician for the U.S. Billie Jean King Cup team, and previously was the chief medical officer for the USTA. Dr. Colvin has also served as a physician at the U.S. Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs, Colorado. She was recognized by Crane's New York business on their Notable Women in the Business of Sports list in 2019. So welcome, Dr. Colvin. And we also have Dr. Melissa Lieber. Dr. Lieber is, a board, is board certified in both sports medicine and emergency medicine. She is an associate professor of, the, of orthopedics and, and emergency medicine at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai as well as the director of the emergency department sports medicine. So welcome ladies and thank you so much for helping us um, tonight understand really just the best ways to return to, to the court safely. Um, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks. So I'm going to share my screen. And so I kind of just want, oops, just want to give the highlights um, for injury prevention for tennis players. Um, and then Dr. Lieber will go and then we'll open up to, to question and answer. So in terms of the topics I'm gonna to touch on, uh, I'm gonna to touch upon stretching, rackets, and then the miscellaneous group. So in terms of stretching, um, a few points I want to make here. Uh, when you're doing a pre-practice or pre-competition stretch, you wanna focus on a dynamic work, a warm up. So this is stretching plus movement. And the point of this is to do those motions that you're gonna be doing on the court to get everything warmed up, just like it's saying. Post-practice or post-competition, you're gonna focus on the static stretching. And that's the stretching that you traditionally think of where you're standing one place and um, bending over and trying to touch your toes. We're not really moving. That stretching um, has actually been shown to de decrease the power that a muscle can generate for up to an hour after you do those stretches. So it's very important that you don't do those pre-performance. Um, so one common question I get is, what are the stretches or warm-ups I should be doing? So I want to point this out to um, you. So if you go to the USTA website, um, there's a section on there um, that um, is, I think, under player development or under tips. Um, and this is actually a bag tag. Um, it's, you know, two sides um, of a bag tag with a warm-up, um, cool-down, um, and actually some small tips for hydration that you can take with you and have it with you wherever you go. Um, and again, it's on the USTA website, so it's very easy to print out. And so you have everything there. The next thing I want to talk about um, was rackets. Um, and, you know, I think we focus a lot on um, other things with injury, but rackets in particular are, are an important um, thing to think about because that is the equipment that you're playing with. And so the first thing, you know, for all those parents um, of junior players, um, I want you to be conscious of the size that you're using for your player. And um, in this case, bigger is definitely not always better. And so just like we focus on the balls um, being kid size and kid friendly, the same thing should be true of the rackets. So um, a child who's not um, skeletally mature or a grown up size, they should not be playing with an adult racket because that is actually predisposing them to injury. Um, the second thing is the strings. So not violin strings, but that's on the icon that I got. Um, so with strings, um, the things for you to think about there as well are um, string tension and string composition. So in general, if your player is not an adult size player, you don't really want to be using poly strings at this time. Um, and the reason for that is because um, when you're using um, strings of that, um, if you're using poly strings um, in a younger player, there's more force being transmitted to that player's arm. Uh, and again, predisposing them potentially to injury. 
And then finally, the grip. So um, make sure the grip size is the right size. Um, and so what do I mean by that? So when your player is holding um, the grip handle, there should be about the size of the small finger between uh, of space um, um, between the fingers. So, um, you know, if the grip is too large, um, they're going to have a difficult time gripping it and, and really, you know, work those muscles too hard, even just trying to hold onto the racket. The second point I want to make about the grip is grip tape is cheap for a reason. It should be changed. And so how often should it be changed? Well, it really depends on how often you're playing, but in general, you want to think about maybe once every three times that you're playing. Um, you know, A, it helps with um, keeping the rack racket from slipping in your hand. Um, you know, the better um, the grip, the more secure it is in your hand. So um, again, it's, you know, $1.50, $2 a grip. And so um, make sure you're changing those grips. And the last thing I want to talk about um, is kind of in the miscellaneous category. So um, these are the things that um, are really important for player preparation. So obviously part of um, competition and, and winning a match is the actual tennis on court preparation. Uh, but there's also a lot of little things um, that go into making um, someone a good player. And so that would be um, making sure that you have, um, and that, that they are prepared. So you have your extra change of clothes, um, including socks, um, that you have your sunscreen, very important. You can definitely get burned on a day that's overcast or cold. Um, if you're traveling somewhere, which hopefully things are opening up now and you get to travel to different tournaments, try to build in that time to acclimatize if you can. Uh, and then finally, um, making sure you have um, enough snacks and food with you so that you stay, um, uh, that, that you keep your energy up uh, and that um, you're, you're ready to go. So I just wanted to show this picture here. This is actually from um, about a year ago in Everett, Washington, um, about a week or so after the first COVID case in the United States had been diagnosed and then discharged home. And then we actually went out with the, the Fed Cup team to play in a tournament. And it's really um, incredible to see how we've come uh, so far in, the, in, this, um, in this past year. Thanks. And I will turn it over to Dr. Lieber. That picture was awesome. Um, all right, so I'm going to share my screen. All right. So um, I'm Dr. Melissa Lieber. Thank you all for being here. I'm going to just get started on some questions that I get frequently. Um, and one is about supplements, nutritional supplements. Will it make me a better athlete? What's safe and what's not? So you should know that a lot of athletes are taking supplements of various kinds. 40% of high school athletes are taking supplements. Um, and this interesting survey, just so you could realize uh, 195 out of 198 Olympic powerlifters said they would take a banned substance if they knew it, they wouldn't get caught. And if they were training for the Olympics, they said, if you could take a pill that would make you an Olympic champion, and, but it would like you kill you after, would you take it? And the majority said yes. So competition is tough. Um, I'm not saying all supplements are safe, but these are two that are safe and commonly used. So creatine um, increases high intensity exercise capacity and increases lean body mass. It's approved as a food supplement. It may actually decrease injury. And there's really no evidence to show any detrimental effects of healthy athlete in healthy athletes. Um, so I would wait till um, in a, your adult or even skeletonally skeletonally mature adolescent, meaning um, probably over age 14, 15 to start using this. But bottom line is it's generally okay. The other big one is caffeine. I'm sure many of you take some form of caffeine, whether it be coffee or energy drinks or whatever it may be before a match or before practice, and it actually does improve athletic performance. So there's a lot of studies to reveal that it is uh, very helpful in many ways, but I just wanna make you aware that these energy drinks, um, especially if your children like them, because they're super common amongst high school and younger athletes. Um, but if you see here in the red circle, this has six, uh, 80 milligrams, excuse me, of caffeine per serving, but three servings in one Red Bull. And that's 240 milligrams of caffeine. That's a lot of caffeine for any one person to be taking it at once. 
Um, a cup of coffee has 60 milligrams of caffeine, just to give you a general idea. So watch what you're drinking. Um, keep in mind, there are some side effects. It is a stimulant, can give you palpitations. Uh, and so in someone who has already cardiac issues, obviously speak to your doctor before trying caffeine as a supplement. But um, you know, when, it, when I wrote that it's easy to become tolerant, that means that once your body is used to having one cup of caffeine every day, it doesn't have the same effect on someone who has one glass or one cup of coffee or whatever it may be once a week, then it'll have a bigger effect. So the more you drink it, the more you need to have the same effect. Um, it improves performance, improves exercise endurance, but does have side effects, but it is safe. So bottom line, it's okay. How do I prevent injury? So monitor your training workload and off-season conditioning programs. Now I know tennis is about to get started again. So many of you are like, oh, I missed the whole off-season. It was the pandemic, et cetera. It doesn't mean that it's too late. It just means that these are important in terms of preventing injury, obviously. And you can incorporate this into your training now. Um, so neuromuscular training, that's a lot of balance work and jumping, hopping on one foot is very helpful in terms of helping ankle stability and knee stability. Um, and then as Alexis covered, Dr. Colvin covered uh, proper equipment sizing as well. How can I find a good balance and prevent overuse? So this goes along with preventing injury. So the definition of overuse is repetitive submaximal loading without enough rest. So that, what that means is you need to gradually progress your training load. So if you progress your training load too fast, it can actually degrade performance and that's called overtraining syndrome. You wanna change up your training regimen. If you do the same training regimen every day, day in and day out, you will definitely develop an overuse injury. And that's the definition of overuse injury. So you wanna change up the frequency, the duration and intensity of exercise, and that will help prevent injury too. Don't forget resistance training. Resistance training, even from a young age, is super important. So a lot of overuse injury can be from muscle weakness as well. So working on core strength, upper body strength, lower body strength, all in body weight exercises and with weights is super important to preventing injury as well. One slide just in general to explain what overuse injury is, is usually an overuse injury, it's a gradual onset, usually happens where tendons insert can cause some swelling or limping, but in general, you're able to finish your practice. You're able to finish your game, even though it hurts. So if you suspect that you're developing an overuse injury, definitely consider rest until pain-free or changing up your changing training regimen. Ice the area that's hurting. Uh, work on different either physical therapy or rehab mechanics in order to correct the biomechanical issues. Um, you can you know, pad in your shoes or whatever it may be that requires um, to improve this overuse injury or see your local doctor. Um, in general, if you can see from this little chart here, 90% of injuries and pain is actually from overuse. And usually overuse problems can be bilateral, it doesn't always have to be, but they're slow and gradual onset. In children, they occur during times of growth um, or right after a period of growth. And usually the pain is intermittent. Whereas if you had a structural issue or something that was a really bad injury that you should stop and see your doctor right away, it's usually more of a constant pain. Both can cause structural issues and overuse injuries can cause tenderness and localized edema. So I get this question all the time. What age can my child start weightlifting? So motor skills progress at different rates, depends on the age. But in general, we actually, all the research shows it's safe to start resistance and body weight exercises when kids are very young. So they shouldn't be powerlifting or bodybuilding, as you can see at the bottom there, that has to wait until skeletal maturity. So usually after age 14, 15, but uh, they can start a degree of body weight exercises, core strengthening and light weights at a young age. Any special considerations on hot days? And this is the last question I'm covering here. So make sure that you're wearing moisture wicking fabrics um, especially light colors is better, far better. Um, Prehydrate. The majority of hydration should really happen the day before a match. And a very physically active adult in a hot day should have six liters of water if, they're, if it's a hot day and an, and an adult. Drink to thirst. And then I wrote about as you age, I don't know if there's any older athletes on this webinar, but as you age, your thirst sensitivity decreases. And so older athletes have a higher risk of becoming dehydrated as well as getting low sodium or hyponatremia. So they have to 
really drink more frequently, even if they're not thirsty. Make sure you have a three to two ratio of sports drinks to water. So it is important to get electrolytes and not just have straight water, especially on a hot day. And in order to make up for sweating, for every 20 mLs or yeah, 20 mLs of a, of a drink, make sure you have a half packet of salt and that will help um, make up for any salt you're losing in your sweat. And that is all I have for you today. So I'm gonna unshare my screen and I think Mana can get, get started telling us any questions that may be coming up. Great, thank you so much, ladies. So, so please feel free to use the chat to ask any questions at this time. Do you want to talk about the one um, question that we got sent before? Sure, I'll pull that up and read it right now. So this question came through today um, from Braden. I have, I have gone through a major growth sport, spurt. I have only been playing around two times per week for the off season, but the cartilage under the growth plate in my shoulder has become inflamed just prior to tennis team season. Any suggestions for a quick recovery and how do I avoid future overuse injuries? I can take this one. So Brayden, um, unfortunately, there's not a way to speed up the healing, especially if your growth plate is involved. Um, and we actually would definitely recommend not trying to quote unquote rush your recovery because um, if your growth plate is still open, if you um, are still growing, um, that uh, is an area that is potentially at risk for um, more damage. And that's definitely not an area that you want to damage. So a couple of things in terms of preventing the injury, um, you know, in terms of what Dr. Lieber talked about, um, I think with planning for once you're able to return um, is um, looking at your training and load um, uh, with your practices and, and competitions. Um, the second thing is um, whenever someone tells me that their shoulder or their elbow or their upper extremity is, is bothering them, um, there's is this concept to think about, which is called the kinetic chain. And so what that means is that you know, your core is the actual part of your body that's generating the power for you to hit a serve um, or to hit the tennis ball. But that's all getting funneled through your arm and your upper extremity. And so while you're rehabbing, you may not be able to do a lot of upper body things, but you can continue to work on your core. Uh, because that will help with um, helping to decrease injury down the road as well. Um, Dr. Lieber, do you want to take the one? I think I saw something about. Yeah, there's a bunch of salt. questions. Yeah, there's a bunch that have come in. The next one that I see is, do you add salt to your water? So that is a really good question. If it's a hot day, um, yeah, it's a good idea to add a half packet of salt per water bottle that will help prevent cramping, heat cramps. The next one is, are resistance bands good for after every practice or less frequently? So nothing should be, it shouldn't be the same thing after every practice. In general, resistance bands are great for, especially for lower body strengthening. Um, but I would say, I don't know how often you're practicing. If practice is every day, I wouldn't do resistance bands every day probably three to four times a week would be awesome if you could do that. Great. The next one. About, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. I saw something about um, if your child is complaining of pain or something like that. Um, so there's two different chats open. I'll oh, okay. this one first then, and then move over. Okay. But th the next one I see is, um, thank you so much for taking your time and giving us great information. I have two questions. Um, how common is, I might be, mispronouncing this, ganglion cysts from playing tennis? Does it occur more in older playing than younger players, older players than younger players? Um, and then the second question is, can the carpal tunnel syndrome be, be diagnosed with an ultrasound and what kind of treatment is usually recommended? Um, so ganglion cyst is um, sort of like a bubble that can be formed, you know, you can, you can get it even without um, any injury at all. Um, it's usually associated with tendons, and I would say it's not necessarily associated with playing tennis. Um, so I'm not sure that's a specific, um, you know, uh, yeah, there's, it's not necessarily related to playing tennis. The second thing with carpal tunnel syndrome, um, it could be diagnosed a couple different ways. It could be diagnosed clinically in the office, um, or sometimes the doctor will recommend that you get something called an EMG, which is a nerve conduction study. 
Um, the treatment really depends on how severe the um, carpal tunnel is. So sometimes it's just splinting um, to keep your wrist in a better position. Um, occasionally, you know, at the other extreme, it's surgery. So it really just depends on what, what it looks like, um, usually in the office, um, to the physician treating. Um, and I think there's a follow-up question to the type of salt. Is it table salt that's used? You can use any kind of salt. Um, if you use those little packets of salt you get at a fast food restaurant or, you know, a little packet of salt, that's actually what we use. For example, at the U.S. Open, we carry packets of salt for the athletes. Um, so someone also asked on the other side on the chat, along with the salt question, how many grams of salt is in a packet? So there's 0.75 grams in a packet of salt, which is 300 milligrams of salt approximately. Um, so you don't wanna use the whole packet, but if you're sweating a lot, it's a hot day and you're in a long match, definitely um, consider putting half packet or a little less than a half packet in your water bottle to help replenish for, from the salt you're losing from your sweat. The next question, thank you so much for hosting this webinar. How does scheduling several, ma several matches a day during tournaments square with injury prevention? It could be warranted occasionally by inclement weather, but cramming three matches in one afternoon at a tournament played indoors could be questionable, especially when a tournament is scheduled for three days and the tournament director wants to finish it in two. You want to answer? Should I, Dr. Colvin? You can answer it. Okay. You know, in general, one day of playing a lot is not going to cause an overuse. It can, I'm not saying it's, it's not going to, but it likely won't. It's actually how you are training and playing over many weeks. So if you have to, if you're forced to end up playing three matches in one day, then it's best to definitely have a rest day. And then on that, the next day after the rest day, consider not playing tennis and doing a different kind of cross training, whether it be strength training or different type of cardio altogether. Okay, so the next question, as a parent, when a kid complains of pain, when do you consult a doctor versus ice and deal with it at home? Mm, that's the um, million dollar question as a parent. Um, so I would say, you know, a couple of things. One is obviously you really need to know your child. Um, and so if you have one of, you know, a stoic child who never complains about anything and then does complain about pain, obviously that's going to raise your, um, your, your alertness to a higher level. But in general, I would say, um, if you're, let's say you're being careful with the training load and you're, you know, everything is done perfectly, um, but they're still having pain. It typically, I would say, is not normal for a child to complain of, of pain. And so um, I think if it's something where, um, you know, I, I don't think you need to rush to the doctor right away, but um, if you maybe give it a day or two and, and it kind of dies down and they're, you know, I, I think, I think the other thing is um, also just sort of watching the child too, especially when they're, um, younger because sometimes they'll say something hurts and then you see them running around um, like, like nothing's ever happened to them. So um, it's also observing the behavior as well. But I think um, I, I would err on the side of caution only because, you know, again, um, kids are still growing, their growth plates are open. And uh, so there are many um, preventable um, problems that can be with um, just, you know, a simple um, evaluation in the office to know that okay, this is something that you should completely shut training down or, you know, it's okay, you know, this just needs physical therapy and you can continue to, to play. One other, one other trick follow-up to that is that if they're having pain bilaterally, meaning say both knees are hurting or both shins are hurting from shin splints, things like that, those are more overuse things. Usually if it's a structural issue or something you should see the doctor for sooner, it's only on one side. The other thing, which is basically what Dr. Colvin said, but if they're able to still play without really changing their, the way they're playing, and if they're not complaining of it while playing, they're just complaining of it kind of at night, especially before they go to bed, that's more overuse and less likely a structural issue or something that needs to be seen right away. Great. So the other thing I want to bring up too is that um, sometimes we'll see, and this is, you know, again, this is knowing your child, but sometimes a child will complain or a kid will complain of pain, but it's not really because it's, you know, an injury, but it's more that they don't want to do the activity. So I think if it's something where it just continues to come up over and over again, at that point, it's maybe a deeper dive into what's the actual motivation. Um, you know, do they not want to go to, to, to tennis or school or whatever it is for something other than just, you know, their, their knee hurts. 
Next question is, what are your recommendations for heating versus icing sore muscles after matches? Is heating before a match unsafe? Dr. Lieber, do you want to do this? Yeah, in general, um, say you're doing well and you have no injuries, um, or if something's just you know hurting kind of chronically, we usually recommend using heat before you play to warm up the muscles and then using ice after you play uh, to cool them down as well as to decrease swelling. So you'll, you'll hear about athletes often going into the ice bath after they have a match or after they have a hard practice, they go and like literally sit in an ice bath um, and that will help with muscle recovery. Um, and that's also helped. That's been, there's lots of evidence to show that that helps as well. Oh, someone said, is heating before a match unsafe? No, not that I know of. Do you know, Dr. Colvin, heating before a match unsafe? Mm, I, don't, yeah, I don't know of any literature to, I mean, I think theoretically when you're, when you're doing your dynamic warm up, you're, you're heating up the muscles and the, you know, the joints and your body temperature anyway, so. True. Um, will this recording be posted? Yes, it will be. Thank you for asking. We're going to be sharing it um, in our newsletter and um, also on the website. We'll link to the website where it'll be shared. Um, what is the best energy gel or drink for a nine-year-old? So there's no specific brand that I recommend, unless I get sponsored by the brand that I'm happy to recommend them. But um, in general, a nine-year-old should be having a drink that has 40 grams or less of caffeine in it. Um, I wouldn't give them more than that. Um, and also, you know, you don't want it to be super high calorie and sugary um, though. So, you know, if, if your child is at a high, is a high level competitor or has a match coming up, then you can give them one of the drinks with a little bit of caffeine in it. Otherwise, probably just having an electrolyte drink like the Gatorade Zero or Powerade Zero, the ones without extra calories or sugar, um, I think are best for a nine-year-old. Great. Um, a half packet salt is how many grams? Oh, I think we cover, I don't know if I said that before, but it's 300 milligrams in one packet of salt. Great. Okay. Um, what kind of stretches are recommended for after practices and matches? Is flexibility very important for juniors or could it be overlooked? So I don't, me, I don't know if you saw the, my talk at the beginning, but I actually posted, um, if you go to the USTA website, um, there's actually a printout that can be used as a bag tag that has both pre um, dynamic warm up, pre match, pre competition uh, suggestions for dynamic warm ups and then also for cool downs afterwards. So I think that's a very handy, really, for all levels. Um, type of information that you have. And so if you go on the website, um, I think it may be under tips or something like that. And so, yes, I would say, yes, it is important for juniors um, because, um, you know, for, for the multiple reasons in terms of their de development as an athlete in general um, and to uh, prevent um, and for preventing injury. Is it common for a player to get calluses on your hand? If so, oops, if so, is there anything that could be done to avoid them? Dr. Lieber, do you want to? Yeah, um, it definitely is common to get calluses on your hand. And speaking as a tennis player myself, I've had calluses on my hand from playing as well. Usually um, you're gripping the racket maybe a little too tightly, um, which I tend to do myself, but also you can get the super soft um, grips to put on like the over grips, which I think can be super helpful. I don't know of anything else that can be done to avoid them, though. No, I mean, they're really your body's way of protecting itself. So um, they're not necessarily a bad thing. My 15-year-old sustained a knee injury last summer that was misdiagnosed as a cramp and later quad weakness. Finally, after seeing an orthopedist, she recommended quad strengthening and hamstring stretching, which she has been dutifully doing two times a day for a month. How long should it take for him to get back to the court safely? It's probably a pretty specific question. I think at this point, I would probably recommend um, maybe following up with that doctor. I will say it's unusual for a 15-year-old, otherwise healthy, you know, competitive tennis player to have quad weakness. Um, so I think if he's been really doing the physical therapy, um, it's probably worth um, seeing the orthopedist just to get a clearance to play. Um, 
uh, if, if, it, if nothing else is really structurally wrong here. My child slipped and had an injury. She did physical therapy and was 95% good as per the physician. She started playing and we started slowly, one hour per week, and after two months, now plays matches. She sometimes complains of soreness if it's a long match of one and a half to two hours, but she is fine quickly after that. How should I move forward? Dr. Lieber, do you want to do this? Sure. Um, so... In general, I think it sounds like your child is doing quite well. Um, I think that all of that in terms of recovery makes sense to me. As long as you're adding in, you know, I said this in my talk earlier, but as long as you're adding in cross training and strength training for your child, I think that that is, it sounds like normal af um, after match soreness. And the next question, what is it like being in the U.S. Open annually? How is your physician team? Um, which doctors usually are on the U.S. Open team? And I love the backgrounds. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so um, I would say last year was probably my 12th year of working at the U.S. Open. Um, and Dr. Lieber has also been there for a number of years as well. Um, and our physician team um, is a combination of um, orthopedic doctors, ER doctors, primary care doctors, all who specialize in sports medicine. Um, and last year, I will tell you the number one, what? Oh, and, and radiologists, yeah. Um, last year, though, I will tell you the number one most important doctor was our infectious disease doctor for obvious reasons. Um, and um, I, I think it's, I, I think for us, I think we both agree that one of the, the great things about um, working there is because we treat patients you know, on a daily basis in our own practices to be able to work with um, such high level competitive players and be able to bring that knowledge from, um, you know, the, the, the latest and greatest in terms of treatments, but also, um, you know, training schedules. And the reason we're able to bring all this knowledge to you is because of that experience. And so I think that's definitely one of the benefits is to be able to share that education then with um, sort of the, um, all the other tennis players um, uh, in our practices. Next question, what is a good practice to conditioning ratio? For example, if I play 10 hours a week, how many hours of fitness conditioning should I do? Um, so, you know, I don't, you know, when you play 10 hours a week, you have to have time to fit this all in. But I would say ideally um, six to eight hours of conditioning. And that means, you know, a little bit of cross training, but also active like yoga, Pilates, and then other strength training like body weight exercises would be great to add on to that. Yeah, I would say it's not, ne not necessarily the number of hours, but more just that you have a complete program. So again, like the core strengthening and um, that you're exercising complementary muscles and, and making sure you're doing low impact things. So um, yeah, again, it's you're, you're playing a very, um, you're playing a number of hours a week. So Um, next question, what is it like working with Dr. Benitez during the open? I know he's a radiologist and all of you guys are so great. Is that Dr. Benitez asking that question? <laughs> <laughs> he is great. Yes. He's wonderful. And he's really knowledgeable. He's one of the, he's like an amazing musculoskeletal fellowship trained radiologist who is wonderful with ultrasound diagnostics and um and also mri he's super hands-on loves to review the images um yeah i think we love having him there right he is great having there yeah um the, the, i would say the definitely the, the coolest thing is that you know he does i would say i'm not actually sure if all the um other major tournaments actually have a, a radiologist on site especially doing ultrasound um and so the players love it that they can see the images if they come in with like a strained shoulder or something like that they can see it while he's doing it um and and um you know be able to talk everything through it while while they're in the room and it wasn't dr benitez asking the question <laughs> okay <laughs> any other questions going once going twice all right. Well, thank you, ladies, so much. That was great. And we, we all really appreciate the time and um, 
it was a really nice discussion and I think we got a lot of questions answered. So thank you again. Um, and thank you to everyone for, for coming to listen on. Thank you for having us. Good night. Have a nice night.